You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Travis with Waterloop. I know a lot of people want to use water efficient fixtures, but they're afraid they won't work as well. Let me tell you about High Sierra Showerheads, which was named Best Showerhead by Popular Science. I just installed one at my house and I was genuinely surprised at the power and coverage of the water. High Sierra Showerheads earn the EPA WaterSense label for water efficiency. They use at least 40% less water than the conventional low flow showerheads. High Sierra showerheads are constructed out of metal, so there's no plastic involved, they're very durable, and they're naturally antibacterial. One of my favorite things, these showerheads are made in the USA by a small business located in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Get 20% off with promo code WATERLOOP at highsierrashowerheads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. I am joined for this episode by Anne Schechinger. She is a senior economic analyst with Environmental Working Group. Anne, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Thanks for having me. I'm oh, so glad you could come on here to talk about nitrate pollution, nitrate contamination uh, when it comes to drinking water really uh, interested to dig into this issue and dig into Environmental Working Group's new analysis that's come out. Um, but a little bit of a table setter first here for folks. What is what is nitrate contamination? What What is nitrate? <laughs> so nitrate's a chemical that can come from a lot of different sources, but in agricultural areas, nitrate mainly comes from farm fertilizers and animal manure. And when fertilizer and manure run off poorly protected farm fields or seep through soil, they can get into surface and groundwater sources of drinking water. And then once nitrate contaminates drinking water, it can be really difficult or expensive to remove that nitrate um, through a drinking water treatment process. And why, why is nitrate a concern? What's the, what's the problems with it? Why, why are you all worried about it being in drinking water? Consuming nitrate in drinking water can be dangerous to your health, actually. So under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the legal limit for nitrate in drinking water is 10 milligrams per liter. And that limit was set in 1962, so a long time ago. And it was based on um, older science that wanted to prevent blue baby syndrome, which is this condition uh, that can potentially be fatal and it essentially starves in infants of oxygen if they consume water with too much nitrate. But then these more recent studies that we're seeing show strong evidence of an increased risk of colorectal cancer, as well as thyroid disease and neural, neural tube birth defects at levels of five milligrams per liter or even lower. So there's just a lot of health issues that could be coming from drinking water with nitrate. Yeah, that's amazing. You said 1962. So that's like before mm -hmm. before EPA was even formed, before the Safe Drinking Water Act was even initially passed. That's going on 60 years ago. <laughs> so it, it's, yeah. it seems like uh, science has progressed a lot in that time. And uh you know, it might be might be the occasion to kind of look at those levels again. I think that's kind of a big gist of of what EWG is interested in. Um, you, you mentioned agriculture is a big source of, of nitrates. Could you? So, how does it get from farm fields to people's drinking water? So, while nitrates can get into drinking water from septic systems and wastewater treatment plants, those are kind of the other sources of nitrate. Really, in these states with a lot of agriculture, it is coming from fertilizer and manure. And so, essentially, when farmers put fertilizer and manure on their farm fields and then get a rain or snow even, sometimes farmers will put uh, manure actually on snow-covered fields, when you get these precipitation events, it just washes a lot of these fertilizer manures off fields and into nearby streams or rivers or even lakes in some places. And then downstream, a lot of uh, drinking water utilities use that water for their drinking water. And in other cases too, like especially with smaller systems, uh, these utilities will use groundwater as their source for drinking water. 
but we also see nitrate leaching through soil of farm fields and directly contaminating uh, groundwater sources of drinking water. And really in these ag states, these fertilizers and manures are the biggest components of nitrate in drinking water. So just in the, as an example, in the Salinas Valley in California, 96% of nitrate contamination of their groundwater, it directly comes from cropland. They know that the state's own data shows that. And then here in Minnesota, we have 72% of our nitrate in sor- surface water sources directly comes from cropland. So we know that this nitrate isn't necessarily coming from these septic systems or wastewater treatments. In these ag states, it really is coming from agriculture. And then I guess there's probably issues with people having it in their private wells if they get their mm-hmm. if they get their drinking water from a well because it can get in the groundwater and so forth. And yeah, and it's not removed by drinking water utilities because of what that old standard is. So some drinking water utilities do remove it. You see a lot of utilities that are above that legal limit of ten actually having to you know, pay for a drinking water treatment system to remove it. But if a facility is under 10, they don't have to remove it. And so a lot of these smaller systems, well, honestly, most systems don't have a nitrate removal treatment process. They're really expensive and you're not going to have one unless the EPA essentially makes you have one because you're above that limit of 10. So, so many people don't have the nitrate removal facilities We really think, you know, preventing the nitrate from getting into the drinking water in the first place is going to be a much better idea than relying on treatment downstream. And and less costly too, I think, right? Mm -hmm. It's just more Much less costly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into uh, Environmental Working Group's recently uh, released analysis. It's kind of a new analysis that has come out. And uh, yeah, what are the findings? So our new analysis found that across 10 states with the most widespread nitrate contamination, 2,111 community water systems had nitrate contamination that grew steadily between 2003 and 2017. So these community water systems serve almost 21 million people in areas of the Midwest and the Southwest and the Atlantic Coast and California. So over half of systems that already had elevated nitrate levels in these states saw their nitrate levels increasing. And we consider anything, um, any system that tests at least once at or above three milligrams per liter to be elevated because we've seen research from the EPA in various states that show that three is kind of the indicator of a human caused nitrate in drinking water. So that's kind of what we use for our elevated level. Okay. And so, so, but human caused, you mean that it's not naturally occurring. It's coming from mm-hmm. some, from some source like agriculture. Okay. Yeah. It's so, not coming from just the soil. Gotcha. Just wanted to clarify that. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. No, that's perfect. Um, so we also found that, you know, among these almost 21, just over 2,100 systems, the smallest communities that are least able to afford Uh, drinking water treatment to remove nitrate are a lot more likely to have worsening nitrate contamination over time. And for all states except California um, that we looked at, almost two-thirds of communities with these increasing nitrate levels were in a rural area instead of an urban area. So this is really affecting small rural communities the most. And we found in Kansas, California, and Texas, they each had almost 60% of their systems that had elevated nitrate had increasing nitrate levels over that time frame. So that's just a huge number of systems that were going up. So as this nitrate contamination continues to get worse and worse over time, we really have to start worrying about more and more people drinking water that's potentially unsafe. Just to follow up on that, is the is the concern really for you know, uh, pregnant mothers, nursing mothers, young children, is that where like the biggest health, sorry to circle back on that. Is that really where the biggest health impacts and health concerns are or, um, at those levels are their concern for, you know, adults? So babies are obviously a big concern, but there's also a large concern for adults. There's a lot of studies showing colon cancer cases, um, uh, increased risk at least of colon cancer cases for drinking nitrate, 
at lower levels, much lower than 10. So there's some studies showing really low levels can start to increase your risk of colo- colorectal cancer. And then also there's been studies that show around five milligrams per liter prolonged exposure to drinking water at that level can lead to this increased risk of cancer. So it's not just babies and children, but also adults. So kind of everyone needs to be concerned about this. If you're in one of these communities with increasing nitrate in your water. Sure. Sure. Um, so these areas that you chose, these States, these regions, um, I'm going to pull up a map here while you answer, but could you talk about, um, what people are, are seeing here on this map? Um, yeah. Sure. We looked at nitrate contamination of drinking water, specifically in 10 states, uh, California, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Maryland, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin. So quite a few states. And we chose these states because in a previous analysis we did, excuse me, last fall, we found white, (coughs) sorry, We found widespread contamination of drinking water in those 10 states, as well as Minnesota. <clears throat> and then we released a similar analysis of these increasing nitrate systems in Minnesota in March. And then we wanted to kind of follow up to see what was happening in these other 10 states mm-hmm. after that. So that's kind of why we chose these 10 states. And we specifically are looking at the individual communities and what their water tests are for nitrate. And that's kind of what the dots on this map represent. Okay. So like there's yellow dots, orange dots, red dots. And so what Mm -hmm. are those, what do those colors indicate? So the yellow dots are all systems that had at least one nitrate test at or above three milligrams per liter in the timeframe between 2003 and 2017. And then the orange dots are systems that had at least one test at or above five milligrams per liter. And then the red dots are those that had at least one test at or above 10. So those ones are the ones that are already above the maximum contaminant limit. So the legal limit set by the EPA. Yeah. I mean, and and you look at this map and it's, I mean, it's really lit up, you know, uh, by an unfortunate number of those, those indicator dots there. Um, you know, I actually grew up in, in central Maryland and I'm pretty familiar with, uh, you know, agriculture in Maryland and ag in that part of Pennsylvania that's just over the border there. You just see an incredible cluster of, of dots through there. Um, it's interesting to look at California also and see uh, how many orange and red dots there are, uh, like you were talking about with the, the valley and everything. So um, why, why are, are nitrate levels rising? We really think there are two main factors that are contributing to this increase in nitrate levels. So farmers continue to have farm fields that aren't protected by conservation practices, and they just keep applying more and more nitrogen fertilizer and manure to these unprotected fields. And then this is kind of combining with more frequent and stronger rains because of climate change, essentially to just wash more and more of these fertilizer manure off unprotected fields. So we really think it's kind of a combination of over-application of fertilizer and manure on unprotected fields and more rain to wash that off fields and into streams and rivers and lakes. And I know one of the big uh, things with, with nitrogen in agriculture is it, it just keeps to build, it builds up in the soil, right? Mm-hmm. It just like accumulates and accumulates. Um, I know that it's also a factor in, uh, water quality in in rivers and bays across the country, right, where they, where it's impaired because of too much nitrogen and algae and dead zones and all, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So it's it's got that environmental impact, and it's got the public health impact on on people's drinking water. Um, I, I think it's uh, the, you mentioned rural communities and small communities as being impacted, and you think about those places and like you alluded to, their ability to address this issue. Um, mm-hmm. Could you talk about, you know, your concerns about, around that? Yeah, so we found that 80% of these community water systems that had increasing nitrate levels were a small or very small community. So that means they serve 3,300 people or less, and that's 80%. So just a huge number of these systems that are really struggling are small or very small. And so these smallest communities really struggle the most because since they are so small, they don't have the ability to spread the costs of a nitrate removal 
drinking water treatment process across a big base of taxpayers, essentially. So when you only have 100 people, which some of these systems that are above 10 have 100 people in their communities, you can't spend $2 million on a nitrate removal process. So these people really struggle with the drinking water. And just the fact that most of these small systems are in rural areas is also tough because we see farms that surround these small communities and those are the ones that are contributing nitrate contamination to the drinking water. And then these small communities aren't really able to afford clean and safe drinking water. And it's tough when you see your neighbors farming and you know they're contributing to that issue. Mm. So the smallest communities really do struggle the most. And you see that in all of these states. You know, California is a really big one where you see just tiny communities struggling with nitrate. But then you also see it on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, like you were talking about, and even in the Midwest in Iowa. I, I didn't have this on my, my list of questions, but I'm just curious about the public awareness about this issue. You know, um, mm-hmm. it, these are a, lo- a lot of people that are impacted. Um, you know, this is probably not something that's at the top of their concern list. Um, yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts on just the awareness among the affected people here uh, of, of what's going on. And I'm sure that's a, a, one of the big reasons why EWG put this analysis together. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. We definitely see some awareness in kind of localized areas. You know, there's been a lot of awareness in Des Moines, Iowa. There was a lawsuit about nitrate and drinking water a few years ago there. So people are kind of aware there. And in certain areas of California, you see people you know, struggling with this and the media has kind of covered it more. But in a lot of the other states, you just, you don't see a whole lot of coverage about this. You you will see some talk about private wells. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. That's something that really, you know, we don't discuss in our analysis, but it's really a huge problem because the EPA doesn't have any control over private wells. So people in a lot of places are drinking really, really high nitrate levels in their well water. So there has been some awareness around wells, just trying to get people to test for nitrate. That's kind of the the issue there. But there has not been a, a huge um, analysis looking at how many people these increasing nitrate levels are affecting before this paper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Well, I'm uh, hopefully your analysis and and you know the the communications work that EWG does reaches some of those those areas and those people, so they can. Get, get aware of, of the issue. Um, I also really just find the California story interesting. You know, everybody thinks of California and, um, you know, the incredible resources that California has mm-hmm. and how progressive it is on a lot of environmental issues. And, um, but then, you know, there's the story with how many people don't have access to drinking water or safe drinking water. And then you've got this issue now, you know, with, with nitrates, um, so yeah, I just kind of wondered for, for more of your thoughts about the California situation. Yeah, California is a really interesting case study out of these 10 states. It's really unique because most of the systems with worsening nitrate in California are actually technically in urban areas. So if you look at the census data, we found that 71% of systems um, with increasing nitrate in California were in an urban area instead of a rural area. But that's mainly because California is different. Um, in this way, uh, because they have a lot of farming in what's known as the urban agricultural interface. So it just means that there's a lot of cropland inside or right nearby high population areas. So like an example is the city of Fresno is surrounded by almost 2 million acres of cropland. So you have a lot of communities that are technically high population or near cities, but they still are having nitrate in their drinking water from these nearby agricultural areas. So we found that um, that drinking water is getting worse in 57% of the communities with elevated nitrate uh, in California. And so that amounts to 669 systems, and those systems serve around 14 million people in California. So this isn't just necessarily a a small rural issue. In California, it really can be a small and a large urban issue. And we found that if you look at all of those systems with increasing nitrate overall in California, average nitrate levels went up by 31% between 2003 and 2017. So this isn't like, you know, just a tiny increase in average nitrate. This really is going up at a significant rate. 
And another interesting thing that I at least find interesting about California is that you, you know, we do hear a lot about um, nitrate in uh, these localized areas in California, in groundwater, in private wells, and small systems that are um, on groundwater sources. But our analysis also found nitrate increasing in surface water systems too. So this isn't just a groundwater issue in California; it's both sources of water. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I think it's significant that you all looked at uh, such a, a long time span, right, from 2003 to 2017. So you're mm-hmm. you're not just looking at a blip; you're looking at a, a good period of time where you can really have more confidence in the trends, I think. And then, mm-hmm. and then like you said, the the increases are not just nominal, right? These are mm-hmm. significant jumps. Um, so some really uh, telling statistics there. Um, one mm-hmm. thing I like to focus on a lot is solutions, you know, um, kind of the, the what's the path forward on, on this? So what, what would EWG like to see happen? What are some of the solutions? In areas that where agriculture really is the main source of nitrate, like all of these states we've been talking about, we really think farmers should be required to implement some kind of basic conservation practices that can reduce nitrate runoff. And these practices can be targeted specifically to areas that we know pollute the most or to specific fields that have a lot of runoff. So right now, most states rely on uh, federal and state-funded voluntary conservation programs. So farmers get paid money by taxpayers to put in certain conservation practices like planting cover crops or stream buffers. And that's kind of the main things that the government uses to try to help, you know, reduce nitrates from getting into drinking water. But we really haven't seen a huge difference in these uh, voluntary conservation programs Because we've seen that since farmers can voluntarily put them in, they can also voluntarily take them out. So a farmer will get paid for cover crops one year, and then the next year when there's no money, they don't plant cover crops. So we really think, you know, farmers need to be required to do some kinds of basic conservation practices in these high nitrate areas. And and we know that conservation practices really need to be uh, specific to a location because you know, what works in Iowa isn't going to work in California, but there needs to be just something that everyone has to do to try to reduce this runoff from going off their fields and into water bodies. Mm -hmm. And I guess states are probably in the best, or that's the best way to go about this is, is state required practices because it's just, you know, regulation of agriculture like that is just not happening at the federal level. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's going to really take, I think, states stepping up and putting in programs. And, and there is USDA money, so that can get funneled over mm-hmm. there. Um, any, other, any other steps forward? Any other solutions that you all think might be good? I mean, do you, do you want to see that, uh, the, uh, you know, a federal drinking water standard um, set at, you know, three micrograms per liter or something like that? I think we definitely want the EPA to look into the federal standard of 10 milligrams per liter. So every six years, the EPA looks at these maximum contaminant limits for all different um, contaminants in drinking water. And a few years ago, through that six-year process, the EPA started looking into nitrate and into reevaluating the 10 milligram per liter limit. And so they did a, a health study and kind of just uh, you know, a lit review of what's out there about nitrate and drinking water and how that affects people's health. And then last year, they just completely stopped looking into it and said, this is no longer a priority for us. So we'd really like them to make it a priority and kind of get back to what they were already doing and evaluate is, you know, if 10 really is the safe limit, because we don't think so. Hmm. Um, last question that kind of circles back to the beginning of the conversation is just there's a lot of different contaminants out there, right? There's a lot of pollutants. There's a lot of things that, mm-hmm. that people are concerned about that you all are concerned about, you know, arsenic or uh, PFAS or lead, you mm-hmm. know, um, why, why, why nitrate? Why put this much work into, I guess, looking at the nitrate issue? I think we've put a lot of effort into nitrate just because it's not super well known. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about arsenic because arsenic has been a huge issue, especially with private wells. And the arsenic maximum contaminant limit actually was changed a few years ago. So nitrates hasn't hasn't been talked about as much in drinking water. So we kind of wanted to shed more light on it 
and just talk about these newer studies because the health studies showing the cancer rates and the birth defects have come about in the last 20 or so years. So we want to kind of promote these studies to just show, you know, blue baby syndrome is not the only issue with nitrate. We all need to be looking out for other issues. So I think that's kind of why we started to focus on nitrate. Mm -hmm. And just from what you were talking about earlier, ag pollution in general causes a lot of other issues. You know, it's this reports about nitrate, but there's a lot of issues with algae blooms and with E. coli, bacteria issues from animal manure running off into water bodies. So there's a lot of other water issues with agriculture. So we kind of like to focus on a lot of those different issues and nitrates, one of the main ones. Yeah. Good deal. Well, Anne, I thank you uh, for coming on the podcast and for sharing the information and talking about uh, Environmental Working Group's new analysis. I definitely encourage uh, viewers and listeners to go to the website and look at it in depth uh, and, and share it to get the word out there. But thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish choice for conserving water, energy, and money while enjoying an invigorating shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop.